Hey, Talking Marketing listeners, it's Alan, and I'm here on the YouTube version of this new episode to tell you about my interview, which you're going to be hearing with Emily Sherio from the Boston B side. Uh, I'm recording a different intro for the video version because the audio version and the video version are going to have slight differences. And I just wanted to clarify that before you pick one or the other, because I kind of recommend both, um, depending on what experience you're looking for this week. Um, Emily's interview was really fun and exciting, and I think both versions are awesome and, and worthy of your time, of course. Uh, the video version is a screen recording of a Google Meet call. Um, that is the original call. We didn't have my usual recording software set up uh, because this episode, uh, you know, the production took a little bit longer um, on the back end. All that is to say, the video version you're about to see on YouTube is uncut, right? It just it, it cuts the intro, cuts the end, but otherwise, Everything that was said is as it was on the recording. And visually, that also includes, you know, my volunteers and other VPs coming and joining the call on mute. So you may even hear some of those Google Meet boodoo noises. If you're like, well, Alan, I really wanted the, you know, your usual high production value produced podcast. Um, go on Spotify. Go look up Talking Marketing. The audio version of this episode is a lot more produced. I cut out a lot of pauses and breaks and uh certain takes of questions that you'll hear Emily, you know, repeating or reiterating um, in a different way. Um, that is available wherever you listen to podcasts. This video version is more just raw, uncut footage. So um, we'll go back to them basically being the same next time. But um, as for today, September, our episode with Emily Sherio is presented to you here on YouTube in full. Please enjoy. Hello and welcome to Talking Marketing, an AMA Boston podcast where I chat with marketing professionals across various industries and try to get to the core of what makes their work impactful. I'm Alan Ibrahim, uh, co-VP of podcasts and content for AMA's uh, Boston chapter. And if you can't tell, I'm half improvising my intro this time, folks, because I'm a little nervous and I'm a little excited, but I'm joined by a legend amongst legends, as usual. Um, and this time on Talking Marketing, please welcome Director of Multimedia Storytelling and Head of Content for the B-Side at Boston Globe Media, an Emmy-nominated TikToker and a passionate Boston sports fan, Emily Sheria. Welcome to Talking Marketing. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. So excited to have you. Again, an episode that's been months in the making um, ever since. Uh, do we remember when the original B-Side event with AMA was? I think it was October of last year. So it was around wow. like the year anniversary of B-Side. That was the one year. Okay. Yeah. And for those who don't know, the B-Side, which Emily uh, runs, is a uh, newsletter from the Boston Globe all about what's going on around in and around Boston with a little bit of education and, as she describes it, uh, a little bit of spinach with your milkshake. <laughs> so <laughs> a mixture of uh, fun and learning at the same time. Uh, Emily, I want to start by talking about how you got to where you are today. You mentioned to me on our prep call that not only were your parents running the public theater in Lewiston, Maine for a while, you're a Maine girly, um, but you, you, you found yourself surrounded at the time by actors and performers very often, and now you're making a mixture of written and video content. So between that and our shared childhood hobby of making little videos of ourselves, um, do you think that the B-side has a bit of theater camp to it? And I mean camp as in campy and you know theater camp. Uh, to its tone slash five. Totally. I mean, I think part of what makes when we were creating B side, obviously there's like the the general what, what, when we think kind of zoom out and think about the brand, um, you know, who we're trying to reach, who we're going after, and then you think about well, how do you walk and talk to to do that? Um, and as the original voice of the newsletter, who is you know, created the ultimate voice and tone and the brand that you engage with. Um, a lot of that is my voice. Um, and so that those, that those are, it's my sense of humor. Um, it's a lot of my experiences. It's, it's my quips it's sometimes like how I kind of, you know, see the Boston area. Um, and part of, especially on the video side of things, like entertainment is kind of at its core. Um, and so while I am not on stage, you know, directing and acting like my parents, 
I there there is an element of performance. It's it's a willingness to look silly in front of the camera. It's a willingness to find the, the humor um, and things happening in and around Boston. Um, you know, maybe sometimes doing something a little embarrassing or humiliating, like I will film in my front yard sometimes and my neighbor DMs me like, what are you doing out there? You know? <laughs> no way. And it's just kind of part of the job. Um, but at the same time, like when you're a, a, a really interesting piece of this that felt very strong, as soon, especially as we launched, is like when you're being creative, there's this level of vulnerability, like at the end of the day, I feel like a huge part of B-side, like I'm in that. And so mm -hmm. when we're first launching this idea of, well, are people, are people going to like it? Yeah. feels a little bit connected to, are people going to like me? Because a lot of this product feels like me at the end of the day. And so obviously, like, you know, don't give your, leave your validation <clears throat> up to like 50,000 readers. But um, I think in a lot of ways, me just kind of, trying to authentically step into this role and tell stories that matter to people and try to entertain people and make them laugh and feel like they're connected to their community um, that and doing it successfully. Like, obviously it's nice as a, it's nice as it's, it's great as a, from a brand perspective and a product perspective. Um, but it's nice because th that was just authentically me kind of leading that and it was able to blossom into something really cool. Yeah, and I think it's important, especially in like content creation, to be authentically yourself. You know, people, especially um, the younger audience that you're appealing to, are, are very keen these days with like, you know, is this a bit? Is this an act? Is this cringe? And I think that the B side manages to like lean into a little bit of that silliness while also, like you said, feeding you like useful information. Um, and it's scary, like you said, being yourself on on camera and on microphone or on in text for that long. But uh, I think you guys reach a really good, it's, it has a really cohesive voice, whether it's you or whether it's your other writers. Um, I think it, it's, it's very cohesive is the word I would use. Thank you. And honestly, like, listen, we've been cringe sometimes. Like, I'm not going to say, like, everything that we put out there has been perfect and, like, tight. Like, of there's been plenty of stumbles. But I think, I think on the whole, like, that's also part of it, too. Like, everyone's going to be cringe. Everyone's going to say something that makes somebody roll their eyes. Like, it's part of the process. <laughs> right. And again, part of it is leaning into it. Because if you try too hard to sort of scrub that out, then, then yeah. you lose the authenticity. So I say totally. embrace, embrace cringe. Exactly. Uh, so a lot of your story leading up to working with the, with the Boston Globe and the B-Side was about interning at these various businesses and I guess realizing that you weren't meant for the corporate office job world, the, you know, beer in the office, the happy hour, that kind of thing. Finding your niche during what you called your grinding period, working with um, in the Boston Public Library's radio space. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience and also what it was like producing TikToks during the pandemic. Yeah, so I really feel like my professional lore, <laughs> um, you know, it kind of goes all the way back to college where, you know, growing up and seeing my parents be, um, be in the arts, in the nonprofit arts world, like they were very much people of we're, we're fighting the good fight, we're doing this because we love it. Mm -hmm. But as a result, there at times may have been some financial instability or, you know, just you always, I think it's always the mindset of like, you always want to be in a better position than your parents. Um, of course. And so even though I've always had inklings of, uh, or interests in performance or politics or the news, the fear of rejection and the competition of those fields and also the worry about like, oh, I know how much people get paid in some of those roles. Like, I don't know if that's going to be stable enough. And so I kind of forced myself down this road of, going into thinking about like, maybe I could go into social media, maybe I can go into marketing, kind of more of the business side of things. Cause like at the time, you know, my 18 year old brain was like, oh, well, those are more stable obviously than being in like the arts or the news or whatever. Um, you know, clearly I didn't know much at the time. Um, but through, you know, like I said, doing a few internships, I just realized those things, uh, things like copywriting and, writing pithy tweets to promote yeah. a product like just didn't feel like me at the time but I was always writing for my school newspaper um and then my senior year of college I had a professor who you know very much gassed me up one day in class and was like you know your voice really sounds like someone I've heard on NPR why don't you come 
to the podcast lab that we're working on and you can voice the podcast and you can learn how to edit. Um, and that little work study job helped me get my first real news internship at WBUR where I was working on, um, on point, which at the time was a two hour nationally syndicated radio show. And it was like light bulbs going off in my head of, oh my God, these people are so smart. There's writing, there's pulling tape, it's, there's pressure. Like it was just such the, it was the right mix of everything. And it was a full-time job with benefits that, well, not like my internship, but the people who worked there, sure. full-time job with benefits that paid well. And I was like, huh. Um, and so that helped launch me into my first real job out of college, which I was a production assistant in GBH's Boston Public Library Satellite Studio, which I believe, you know, in hindsight, I was there for four years. I worked my way up from a production assistant to a producer. It was truly the best first job out of college. I had a really incredible mentor named Linda Pollock, who was a TV news veteran. Um, I learned how I, the the role itself, we did so many different things because the space, the, the mandate was like, just have things going. So I learned how to report for audio. I learned how to produce TV. I learned how to film, how to edit. I just said yes to everything. Um, and as a result, at the end of four years, had this really well-rounded tool belt of skills yeah. that I could kind of, I don't want to be like, I could write my ticket anywhere, but I had the opportunity to be a little bit like, oh, well, if I wanted to go into the podcasting world, I could, if I wanted to go into TV, I could, you yeah. know? Um, but like you mentioned before, the last nine months of my time at GBH, I was, I started making news TikToks and it, yeah. kind of, it was very much a happy accident, kind of just fell into it. I, it, it was the year that the Boston Marathon, it was the first post COVID marathon. So it was October, 2021. It was, you know, off season, kind yeah. of strange. Everything's, we're coming out of COVID, getting our footing with everything. Um, and I remember at the time asking the newsroom, like, hey, most newsrooms at the time hadn't capitalized on TikTok or vertical video in the way that they are now. And I was like, what if we made a couple of TikToks about the marathon? And my boss was nice enough to let me go do that. And so in, in the week, I filmed three TikToks. One of them was like, here's a history of the Boston Marathon. One of them was a day in the life of a reporter at the Boston Marathon. And the third one, which is the one that went viral, was me telling the story of how Heartbreak Hill got its name while running up Heartbreak Hill. Wow. <laughs> and that video went viral relatively speaking for gbh i think mm -hmm. at the time it got well over a hundred thousand views and had around twelve thousand likes which very few pieces of its content had done something like that and it was kind of one of those aha moments for everybody like oh this worked we just reached this whole new audience mm -hmm. we just told these this local story let's try it again and so uh, the next one that i did was about uh it was the election for Mayor Wu and Anissa Saibi George to be, you know, it, whoever won, it was going to be a historic election. It would right. be the first woman and uh, person of color as mayor in Boston. And so I did a little explainer video, which did well. And then a couple weeks later, once uh, Wu was elected, we did another video about what can the mayor actually do? Because Wu, her whole shtick at the time was like, let's free the tea. I want to bring back rent control. And sure. there was all this chatter about, well, what can the mayor actually accomplish? And so I kind of answered those questions within 60 seconds. That video took off. And internally, I think everybody at GPH was like, oh, we need to keep doing this. But of course, I had a, I had a job. I don't, right. like, it was just this little side project. So over the course of several months, I would occasionally churn out these videos when I could. Um, and as a result, I kind of had, I, I probably did like 10 to 12 videos, but five of them were really solid in the news world. And we submitted those for a New England Emmy and they got nominated, which was incredible. Like, so incredible. And also like, you know, there are two things in my life that I'm most proud of right now. Um, it's creating B-Side, obviously, like that is my baby, but it's also getting that nomination because that is something that I just decided to do. And it was like, it was authentically me. It was, I was doing those pretty solo. I had an editor who was maybe like tweaking things in my script, but from soup to nuts, that was me. And I was like 24, you know, right. just around. And 
to get validation from an academy that in a lot of ways like you know it, it's for tv the emmys mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was one of the first tiktoks to be nominated so um I felt well, that was one of those moments where I felt like I could take the target off my back and be like, I don't have to prove myself. I've done it. You know? Yeah. You've, you've hit the bar and now your, your only goal is to exceed it or do something that you want to do that you feel creatively satisfied by. Totally. Totally. I think that's a theme that comes up on this podcast is a lot is people, um, or just like your arc is very familiar. People like starting somewhere and saying, Oh, this seems stable, but what if I tried something creative and, you know, it's funny, like one of the questions I had asked you on our prep call was like, did you expect to see yourself here, you know, a while ago? And you immediately were like, no, of course not. Like, because nobody expects that they make a couple of local viral TikToks and then that becomes a big chunk of your career that then totally. catapults you. It just, you know, the most interesting career paths are the ones that you don't anticipate. Um, and so I'm curious, actually, kind of following up on that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, video creation and, and newsletters are really, really awesome right now, really successful. And the B-side's been really successful. Um, just being realistic, though, I know a lot of like written publications right now are struggling with whether it's financing, whether um, it's, you know, the higher ups understanding what you're making and, and how and why you're making it, why it's valuable. Um, really? We're noticing a lot of these like publications either shuttering or like taking hiatuses. I'm curious then, Emily, like, what do you see as a future pivot for you? Or do you see a pivot after this? What what industry would you either go back to or, or switch into? You know, it, it, that's such an interesting question, because I feel like in the same way, like two years ago, before I started this job, if you were to ask me, like, what's your backup? What's your pivot? Yeah. I didn't know something like B-Side could exist. And so my my backup probably would have been something really different. I don't know, maybe like being a producer at a radio station or a TV sure. station. Yeah. Um, I think what something that I've really loved from B side, especially now that I'm a little bit more in a manager role and I have a writer with me, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll coach some folks on the boston.com side of things for video. Mm -hmm. um, I've always really loved Kind of like the mentoring teaching aspect of this all like personally down the road this isn't i wouldn't say this is a backup like if i got fired tomorrow but um i would love to teach or be a professor at some point yeah. um because when when i went to college i didn't major in journalism i took like a digital media production class that's kind of like the extent of my experience with you know um my college experience at least with like producing and filming and stuff um but, you know, there, I feel like there's very few mentors out there for people that are operating in my space because right. it's so new. And so that's something like, you know, when people reach out to me who are students at local colleges or I'll have people from my alma mater reach out to chat, I always say yes, even if it means it's like cutting it to my personal time right. because I didn't have that. Um, you know, if I, I, you know, hypothetically, if I got laid off tomorrow um i would maybe consider i would maybe consider doing some kind of um m like my own services or something in that matter like be it social consulting i i think at the end of the day like i love storytelling i love producing i love the craft of it i love like the challenge of taking something complicated and making breaking it down to be simple and digestible yeah. and so um you know, whether that's on my own or in a, in a different role within a different organization. Um, but those are kind of like the key pillars of what I ultimately value at the end of the day. Yeah, it seems like paying it forward is a big part of it for you. You know, you learned all this stuff you got here and you'd like to communicate those things to other people, whether they're clients or students of yours. Hey, here's what works and here's what doesn't work. Which totally. Is and it's also like this industry at the end of the day, too, like, it's tough. It's competitive. Like, you know, you know, we're you look around you. There's newspapers around the country that are laying people off. Like it's, it's a tough time to be in the media. And so, um, I think like being, being able to be nimble and, uh, flexible and something I always tell young journalists when I'll be at a panel or be talking to folks is, being a in my opinion personal opinion being a, just a writer these days is not enough 
Right. You need to you need to be a multimedia journalist, and that means having a proficiencies in audio editing and video editing, um, knowing how to make some kind of uh, vertical video, um, being able to write for broadcast, and the more. I think the more well-rounded you are in the, those areas, the more stable your career will ultimately be. Right. Going wide, not deep, you would say. Totally. And I mean, obviously, the older you get, you're kind of naturally going to get deep into some things. But, um, you know, I remember there were times when I was in my first and second year on the job and I would be comparing myself to a lot of, of other journalists my age who I'd see on Twitter um, or now X. Um, <laughs> and be like, oh my God, they're going, they're a reporter at this very big publication and they're relatively fresh out of college. And I'm this production assistant who's like doing just a bunch of different things and feeling this pressure at the time of like, I need to move faster. I need to move faster. I need to find what my niche is. And I think what I've learned from that whole experience is like what I tell people who are feeling like things aren't moving fast enough. It's like, Everybody has a different cook time, but everybody still cooks. Ooh. And so, like, you know, their cook time may have been six months. My cook time, I think it, at, you know, early in my career was four years. Yeah. But it was like this, this whole snowball of saying yes to things and gaining confidence and feeling like, oh, let me ask to do these TikToks. Let me try this. And like, I couldn't have done that my first year on the job because I didn't have the chutzpah at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, and you mentioned too that um, something that's been so great about, and we'll talk more about the b side in particular, but them like letting you do the things that you want to do, letting you turn it into what you want instead of them giving you a guideline and saying, make it this, they mm -hmm. kind of, met you where you are and, and said, okay, well, what, what does your audience actually want to hear about and what do they care about? Totally. Yeah. And honestly, like good kudos on GBH and the globe because, you know, I was 24 at the time for GBH. I was 26 when I started working at the globe, mm -hmm. like to give the keys to a young person in that way, that's a risk. Big like time. it's not lost on me that that's a risk and I'm so glad that they took it and I'm so glad that it's paid off for, mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, but I, you know, I think B side and this, the TikToks I did at GBH were a good example of if you're, if you're really wanting to meet young people where they are, like let the young person drive because they know where they are. Exactly. Yeah. I think trusting the young people is so important now, especially, you know, we have, this is an election year. We're talking mm -hmm. a lot about like what the next generation is going to do and how they're going to handle things like climate change and the, mm -hmm. the current state of the country. And it's like, mm -hmm. what if you ask them what they care about? You know? okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> speaking of career stuff, just as a personal question, like, you know, we talked about going wide and not deep. And something I've always mm -hmm. dreamed of since I started podcasting was doing something with radio. And I know that you mentioned you've, you've gone in and out of that, that industry. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have advice for somebody like myself who's like, talented in a lot of different ways, but like mostly does want to go deep on certain things like radio yeah. or, or do industries like that? Yeah. I mean, I think building your portfolio is one of the best things that you can do because at the end of the day, like, especially the older that I get, like, mm -hmm. yes, it's important that your resume is up to date. And like, it, it is nice to see people who are, have, are working in the industry that feels relevant to the role that you're hiring. But like if your portfolio sucks, I don't care if you worked at a super high profile institution or like if your pieces aren't good. Yeah. Um, and I think too, especially, you know, when we're all going to college and we, when we're 22 and we graduate, like none of us still really know what we want to do. Like people are pivoting throughout their whole lives. Um, and so if you don't have the stuff that you can write down on a resume, like there's stuff that you can do in, on in your own time. And so uh, for you, for instance, in the audio editing world, like if somebody was really starting off with no audio editing experience, there's tons of free courses. I think Linda on LinkedIn has some stuff. Um, there's lots of things on YouTube. Like there are just kind of creative projects and benchmarks that you can set for yourself. Um, and, and just being consistent with that at the end of the day, because those like you, ha those skills are just as valuable in a lot of ways right. like because the hard skills at the end of the day 
Right. It's the stuff that you can, like you said, learn from a YouTube tutorial or a LinkedIn person. And then mm -hmm. having the personality and having the, the creative juice is the part that you'll teach yourself, that you yeah. cultivate yourself. Totally. Um, talking more about the B side as we start to hit our tail end of our easy, our um, bigger questions here. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about how it was founded because it sounded really interesting, uh, very similar to a startup. Um, I want to talk about this, this innov innovation day that birthed the B side. How did that come about? Well, so funny enough, Innovation Day, that this Innovation Day in particular happened before I came to the Globe. So, um, but how I understand everything unfolded was uh, the Globe has this thing, I believe it's now twice a year, but they, for, they frequently have this thing called Innovation Day mm -hmm. where employees propose some kind of idea for the Globe. It can be big, it can be small, um, but it's put on this platform where employees can then all vote for it and right. the vote the the proposals that have the most votes um then get you know thrown up to the senior leadership and then there's an opportunity for some kind of funding or implementation um and it's not just like you know it's not just like a half-baked idea like you know eventually the further along it gets there will be some kind of like deck created and like real proposal in place sure, but yeah. um at the time, I believe it was October of 2021, this is when newsletters were really booming. You have like journalists ditching their publications to go work at, do have their own sub stacks. Um, you have um, venture backed publications like 6AM City and Axios spreading across cities um, doing morning newsletters. And so um, the Globe was like, we, why aren't we doing this? You know, how, and so I, I, my understanding is the ultimate goal was to reach younger audiences at the end of the day or reach new audiences. Um, so when I was applying for this role, I saw this very nebulous job position uh, for a lead writer and a multimedia producer. That was basically just like, we're doing this newsletter to reach new on to reach a younger audience. You know, it doesn't have a name. It's not, there's no format to it. Um, but through my interview process, I effectively, like through certain assignments I had, was creating very early iterations of B-Side. Um, and yeah, so we, I think the first, you know, thoughts of it came October 2021. We officially mm -hmm. launched, I was hired in August of 2022. We launched October 2022, which in hindsight, my colleague, Andrew, who's the general manager of B-Side and my boss, he's great. Um, if you're listening, hi, Andrew. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we reflected as we're coming up on two years of B-Side, how we launched something in like three months, which is kind of wild yeah. um especially something that like we had goals in mind and we had a rough idea in mind but like we didn't really put pen to paper until like end of august september and it's a it's an impressive uh you know project right because this is a five days a week newsletter that so far at least other than holidays like hasn't really missed a day to my understanding no uh, we take we take fourth of july week off because everybody's kind of mentally checked out that week. And then we take the week of Christmas through to New Year's off. Which tend to be very slow news weeks anyways. So it's like, how much value totally. is there? Or at least my attitude is, even if it's not a slow news week, I I don't feel the need to be in your inbox. Go hang out with your friends and family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you're talking about the boom of newsletters. And I think it's a combination of like social media and people's perception of social media kind of dipping for a while and mm -hmm. this desire for like truly human created authentic content that's like useful mm -hmm. and you know something I, I was telling you that I just love about the b-side is that it kind of like encourages you to go outside you know it's like mm -hmm. there are things to do in the city this is not just like the world is bad and you should feel bad uh or you should feel um less than other people which is what a lot of social media unfortunately does to people the totally. B-side is more like there are things happening in your area. They're real. They're cheap. They're fun. And also here's what's going on that's relevant to you. Totally. And that was one of the problems we were solving for. Like it is as, as a journalist, it is incredibly difficult and depressing to be an informed person. Of course. Of course. Um, the news cycle never stops. You know, algorithms are often designed to divide us. Mm -hmm. Um 
at the time we were really like 2022 was kind of like the first real full year coming out of the pandemic Mm -hmm. um in a way where things were opening back up again and so you had this young cohort of people who you know may have spent these really formative years inside it's like okay well here's this resource that's going to get you outdoors and help you feel connected to your community again and so i think and thinking about those like three pain points for our ideal reader um those really help drive the ultimate vision um who who would you consider to be the b-side persona the reader uh because i know they talk a lot when i was in like marketing school they talk a lot about like who's the person you know is it what's that what's that person look like well it's funny you say that we had a branding exercise um with our uh the woman who was incredible was very instrumental in taking b-sides brand from zero to one her name is olivia ives flores um and we had this exercise where it was our north star follower and so we had to name her it was it was basically creating a profile for her so name age where she went to school what she majored in what's her current job what does she make um what outlets does she engage with from like influencers to news right um we did like a full day in the life of when from the time she wakes up to the time she goes to bed like literally what is she doing and right. like every kind of movement um and so our our north star follower is a 27 year old uh local named madison Sousa. uh she l- lives in somerville says she lives in boston though but she can't afford in boston um she is a young marketing assistant who's making around sixty five thousand dollars a year she's on the business side but would like to be on the creative side she watches the bachelor she reads the scam newsletter she watches the washington post TikToks. um she you know she's the she's the friend that is always like game to try something new or go out with friends um you know she votes she uh, she votes in the the main elections. Maybe she's like skipped the primaries a couple of times, but um, you know, I, I have to go back and like read through everything. But yeah. like that is, it's very when you're talking to an audience of fifty thousand people, it's or any audience for that matter. Matter, I think as you grow, as your as your brand grows, it's sometimes easy to get tripped up in the who am I trying to talk to um and sometimes people are so concerned about not connecting with everybody that they end up trying to connect with everybody and then it does it falls flat and it feels hollow and so you know even for myself there are times where i'm kind of like what should i like what's the right pick for this or you know what makes the most sense for a story or a social card or whatever and then i kind of think well what would madison want to see you know oh i love that so and and madison i think has evolved too like we could probably go back and now that we have a lot more information about our audience we can make some tweaks um but i would say like she's been she's she's we've stayed pretty true to her like our audience is we have around uh, around 50,000 email subscribers between Instagram and TikTok around um, combined close to 80,000, I think. Um, most folks are under 35. We're predominantly young women, too. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that's, that's Madison. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> wow. So I guess, yeah, always keep Madison in mind when you're like, what are we, what are we creating? What's interesting to people? Totally. I love that. I love how specific they, they had you guys get because that's, you know, really useful. And it's like, well, when we don't know what we want to make, just remember Madison on a basic level. Totally. totally. And so you've credited a lot of people who have helped you make, the, who have helped create the B-side. I know uh, Gio Arsino is one of the other credited writers. It seems like it's the two of you primarily. Um, mm-hmm. But do you want to shout out or talk about a couple of the other people who make this five days a week uh, newsletter happen? Yeah, so I would say the the big ones are myself and Gia, and I have to give Gia a lot of credit. Um, so when we uh, when we started the newsletter, it was myself and another producer, and then for a while it was just me, um, mm-hmm. which was very difficult. Um, and Gia coming on, you know, she's uh, a Wheaton College grad, and has just made leaps and bounds over the last year. She's a she graduated, I think, in 2023, 
Um, and I would say is writing the majority of the newsletter most of the time now, which is awesome. And um, she has a really sharp sense of humor and has just developed really nicely as a journalist. So gee, if you're listening to this, you're doing a great job. Um, and we have our editor, Caitlin Johnston, who's the editor of boston.com, who's been there since the beginning and was, you know, especially when we were first writing this, she has a wealth of knowledge in this mm -hmm. world and was really helpful in kind of shaping certain sections and shaping the stories we should and shouldn't be talking about, et cetera. Um, and then Andrew Grillo, he is the general manager of B-Side, so handles all things business revenue for us and was also from there since the beginning. He hired me um, and has like is just such a, a driven, ambitious guy who is, you know, like myself, we just get B-Side to its core. And so yeah. it's really nice having um, a boss who just gets it yeah. too. Um, like we're 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 freakishly aligned <laughs> right so but at the end of the day like we're small team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. small but mighty and I, I imagine because it's so current a lot of times it's like are you writing headlines and finishing things like literally hours before or like the night before generally yeah i mean so we try to actually work in like the nine to five window um the the times they're like on election nights for example you know i'm up until 11 or 12 i'm waking up at six to finish the newsletter um but because I, I would say because of the kinds of stories we choose to share we have the luxury of not necessarily having to wake up at five in the morning to finish something there are some newsletters where like they wake up at four to publish at eight yeah and that's their day um mm -hmm. that just doesn't make sense for b-side and the kinds of content the kinds of content we're sharing um but, but yeah yeah you don't want to create a schedule for yourself where you don't live the way that your persona does because then you kind of distance yourself from who you're writing about you know it's like if i'm yeah. not go if i never have time to go out then i can't write about what there is to do in boston <laughs> You know, that's such a great point. I hadn't even thought about that. But yeah, if I'm like a zombie by myself, like where I'm just going to the gym at like 2 p.m. and then yeah. going to bed at 7, like that's not really a relatable experience. Exactly. You kind of want to live a little bit of the life like who you're re writing to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, my final question about that is, you know, we talk about the persona and we talk about who y'all are. Um, mm -hmm. That persona, that person, that, that character is aging, right? And so what you write about i'm curious then is is that person always you know 20 in their mid-20s or are they aging with you so like in five years from now does the b-side become for people in their mid-30s you know that's a great question and that's something that i've thought about myself i mean i don't i i candidly i think the answer right now is i don't know yeah um that's fair i i don't see this newsletter aging with me because this newsletter like isn't about me if i wanted to do that i'd start up my own blog or something sure um, i think b-side is meant to be a resource for young bostonians um and so even as i you know i'm, I'm 28 now uh -huh. i i think i still have like i probably another like solid 10 years yeah oh yeah <laughs> but um the the reality is i think as hopefully as b-side grows we continue to grow and the great false thing about having g on the team too is like she's on the younger side mm -hmm. so like we balance each other out in terms of our perspectives and experiences she's like a core true gen z i'm technically like a, a zillennial in yeah. the way that like you know i've been <laughs> I've been like traumatized by like the girl boss work ethic, but like still watch TikTok and get all the jokes. But yeah. when it comes to Gen Alpha slang, I feel like a boomer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think we're. It, long story short, I think we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But that the product won't change with me. The product is gonna keep serving who it's meant to serve. That makes sense. Yeah, I think. Um 
it, I talk a lot about like because I just turned 30 this year and it, it's like I read these newsletters and I'm like I understand that some of this just isn't for me like this yeah. like some of this culture is just not for me and that's fine you know yeah. I can read a newsletter being adult about it but yeah. I don't myself want to write a letter for like 16 year olds getting out of high school because I'm no longer my experience about that is no longer relevant but yeah. that's like way way down the line like not something for you to consider at this point just like something totally. I thought a lot about totally totally um, and as we reach the tail end here, I have some more fun questions for you, Emily, since like we said, the B side manages to be informative and fun. Um, and I structured these like an issue of the B side. So, uh, as I went through the last couple of days of, of issues, I was, you know, noticing, we always talk about what's on tap. So what we're going to <laughs> talk about, um, is local businesses, food, drama, and of course, some local headlines. Um, Love it. Your featured piece, the first part of every B-Side newsletter, is usually about like a local business, uh, local restaurant, etc. What's been your favorite beat to follow since starting the newsletter? Like what's been your sort of um, Roman Empire? Yeah, you know, I think the stories that I've enjoyed covering the most have to do, it's either um, dating yeah. or um, TikTok and Gen Z trends. Mm -hmm. um, I I've always been really interested in internet culture, and you know I'm a former common English double major, and some of my favorite coursework was critical theory and media literacy and media criticism. Mm -hmm. And so I always love talking about like I did a piece on girl dinner last yeah. year. You know, like those are the kinds of thinking about like how these trends that engulf us for you know a brief period of time like mm -hmm. what do they what do they speak to in our current culture and in and, and moment i find that to be really fascinating um and i also i, I think the dating stuff is so fun like yeah. and that's also so top of mind especially to our readers who are you know i think a lot of them are either single or in a relationship or, you know, thinking about, or maybe it's complicated. I don't know, but it's sure. very top of mind subject for people our age. Um, like I did just, I, I, and sometimes it can be, you know, like I did a story about uh, the kind of renaissance of speed dating with, yeah. so, which yeah. I thought was um, really fascinating to see like data support that. And then talk to a couple people in the space to see like, well, why is this happening now? Yeah. Um, and then but then i also did a story about dog fishing and how people will like take post photos of themselves with dogs on their dating profile that aren't their dogs because it makes them come off a certain way right right and like the people i i didn't think that would be a big thing but i interviewed tons of people <laughs> who were like oh my god yeah like i gave my friend my dog to do that <laughs> It's fascinating. Yeah, the dating scene is, is especially in Boston, like, you know, has this perception of like, it's all um, it's a lot of finance bros and a lot of like girl bosses just figuring out how, what to do in the seaport. Like that's like the basic stereotype of dot Boston name. It's a lot more broader than that. Obviously, it, it totally. reaches cultural and gender boundaries. Um, so that's a really fascinating one. And I haven't I didn't think about that much, but I have noticed a lot of the data and like interesting stuff I've read about dating has actually come from your work. So that makes more than enough right. sense. <laughs> um everybody loves the b-side polls uh i know you mentioned on our call that there's almost this like community of people who leave comments and have sort of funny banter and tight fives in the comments of each yeah. poll i was yeah. and, and how proud they are to be featured i myself was featured um and i remember exactly which one it was yeah uh it was you were doing a bracket of nightlife in boston yeah yeah and club cafe ended up winning that time and i was the one who left the comment that was like i'm pretty sure i'm going there tonight <laughs> and and I felt like I felt so cool, and I'm also probably going there this weekend again. So I'm really glad that it's besides number one. Uh, oh, that's amazing! Yeah. yeah, no, the polls are the polls are hilarious. Like like you said, everybody who reads B side now is apparently a comedian. And yeah, they will like try their hardest to get featured, and we'll get emails from readers when they get featured, or we'll post about it on Instagram of like, "Yo, look at me at the bottom of B side today." Yeah. So it's that is a piece of writing this that. I didn't anticipate and it's mm -hmm. been such a joy. Yeah. So, um, my, my, uh, quick questions for you. I have a, a couple, a, qu a quick hit of three <laughs> and I gave you some time to think about these, even though I know they're yes, high, yes. high difficulty, um, musicians that you like chaperone, Noah Khan, who are we picking? Ooh, chaperone. Wow. I, 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 that's my, I agree. Uh, I thought that would be a tougher one, but I'm glad. Uh, did you see her VMA performance by any chance? 
I, I didn't. Um, I I was out that night, but I I I've been catching some things on TikTok. I did see her at Boston Calling. I was there to cover. Boston oh my god. Calling. That was, I mean, the crowd was crazy and there's a whole other thing we could get into, Yeah. but they're very, I, I wouldn't call myself a music festival person. I, I just find it to be like a little overwhelming and then I'm just zapped at the end of the day, yeah. but I was so excited to be there. She's, yeah, she's quite a, a sh uh, she puts on quite a show. Um, she's just like a hit of dopamine. It's just like dopamine hit after dopamine hit. Like, yeah, she's yeah. great. No, I do recommend that VMA performance because it's very, um, it's very camp in a good way. Very exciting. Yes, for sure. Um, you're a Boston sports person. You just launched B-Side Sports recently. Um, Patriots or Bruins? Pats. Really? Have you been a Pats person for a long time? Yeah. My So my dad it was is originally from Ohio. So he okay. um, was a Browns fan forever, which is like really hard to be a Browns fan because they generally are bad. Um, <laughs> And then, um, but then he, you know, he moved to New England in the early '90s to to run the theater, and obviously becoming a Pats fan um, was pretty effortless, given that from like the early 2000s to you know the last couple of years, we've been, it's been the dynasty. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, I've been. I remember when we lost the Super Bowl to the Giants in, the, in that season where we were like you know, going to have a perfect season had we not lost the Super Bowl. And I remember, like, sobbing at the end of the game. I think I was, like, really? 10 years old. And, like, talking trash at school the next day. So, yes, I of course. passed, for sure. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, um, I, I've never been a, a hugely invested in the sports, but I recently started going to live game, like, games in person. And mm -hmm. I really enjoyed live baseball. And I'm curious about live football next. I've heard it's that one can be more fun to watch at home, but I've heard mixed opinions on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think baseball has. I, I went to a Sox game recently. Ever mm -hmm. since they put in um, the the pitch timer, so that things have to yeah, move fast. Yeah, it's a much more interesting game. Um, I haven't seen a Pats game live, but I agree. I'm probably the type of person that would prefer to watch it at home because I don't want to just stand in the cold for four hours. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> I don't know where I read about this, but they were talking about because the NFL season just started, obviously. Uh, yeah. Some people are really big on like football stadiums should be enclosed, clean, perfect spaces. And some yeah. people are like outdoors in the elements. I want it to snow during a football game. Yeah. Uh, I'm past, past for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. It's just like, okay, I'm going to brave the elements to go watch something that I could also watch at home easily. And then like the reality is I can only afford the nosebleed seats. And so I could, I have a, this lovely TV. I can see all the plays. I, right. you know, they have the 10 yard line, very clearly labeled right. out. <laughs> so yeah yeah i heard because i want to do a hockey game next i think the bruins start relatively soon and mm -hmm. there are a lot of rules that you just don't ex understand in person like when does i when is icing happening you just hear a whistle blow and you're like i don't know why that happened but they'll say in the broadcast totally. like that was because of icing um, yeah the bruins are i mean i've been to a couple bruins games and they're they're also just fun because like the crowds are so rowdy yeah yeah. there's fights like there's just sure. a, there's just a grittiness to those games where it's like sometimes they'll just get pissed off and throw off the masks and boom <laughs> yeah yeah so what people come for sometimes yeah exactly and then my final of these questions was we we're talking about dating earlier and this is specifically like place you'd rather spend time in or place you'd rather go on a hypothetical date although i know you're engaged so this is like a different question for you um <laughs> mfa or boston public garden boston public garden interesting yeah. So can so, you say more okay. about that? So I I love them both. Yeah. I would say I I've always loved the garden. Um I used to actually walk through it every day when I would walk to work to go to the um the rate the studio at the Boston Public Library. Yeah. And so yeah. there is to me, especially in the spring and the fall, like there is just something about walking through this um, beautiful green space where you're surrounded by, I say skyscrapers, you know, but like sure. taller buildings. Um, we're like, we're not New York, relax. <laughs> um, but uh, there's actually a spot in particular that um, when you're walking through the garden towards New Newberry Street on the left side, where there's kind of the, the, the side where the swan boats are that piece of the little pond yeah. where you there's a bench with these big draping willow trees and you look out and you see like the hancock building peeping through and like oh i just, i have several versions of that photo on my phone but in terms of like an interactive date yes the mfa is wonderful i love it you could get lost in there for hours but um 
I, I'm a sucker for a nice landscaped park. Yeah, I had the pleasure of working right next to the public garden for a while. I have, We still have an office over there. I just don't work there. But every day during lunch, I would see people on dates and be like, you know, this seems like the spot. But um, I think the MFA has a little bit more conversational potential. So it oh, depends on what sure. you're looking for. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think the MFA, too, is like if you're with somebody who's not into art. Yeah. It's a little, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the Boston Mill Garden is like a nice neutral That's a good space. point. And it's free. That's, the That's true. That's true. Yeah. The, the MFA does rely on both people like investing enough to care about what they're yeah. looking at. You I think not. there's a little bit too with the MFA. Like um, I think both of you need to be on the same page that you want to go. And also like sometimes like the the galleries are you want to be a little hush hush you know what true. i mean so, um but again both of them are nice spot, first date spots so <laughs> you can't go wrong i, I love it that's uh, my political answer <laughs> i love it yeah i was gonna say you've been very media trained <laughs> <laughs> uh the next segment is quick and dirty headlines this is usually about why the tea is messing up or what's going on <laughs> around the city um so my first one is quick what is your favorite mbta line and or station Oh, that's such a hard one. Um, hmm. I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to think through. Like, Worth things. noting, Emily, I do work for the T. So any answer you say does and will reflect on me as an employee. <laughs> oh, okay. So in terms of like, so the, the, the lines that I ride the most are probably the green, the red, and the orange. Um, all of which have been as of late fine like i've had i shouldn't say lovely but like they've been perfectly fine experiences um i would this is probably going to be like a crazy answer but i i really like park street sure um, i you know i like it from an accessibility standpoint you have the red line and the green line there um i it feels very like classic yeah. Boston to me in the sense of like you hear like the screech of the green line oh yeah that's also the station when I was in college and when coming to school that was always kind of the hub that I'd get off of from um the red line coming from the Quincy Adams stop mm -hmm. um but and I'm trying to think but my actual like favorite line in terms of functionality is the blue I'm it is just like the least problematic we love it her. It feels the quietest. It feels the cleanest. Yeah. Like, love her. But my, I, I'm giving you like 10 different answers. Actually, I will say, I, I think one of my fate, hold on, let me backtrack this all together. <laughs> I've, now I've had time to think about it. My favorite MBTA stop is the Charles MGH stop on the red line. Ooh. Um, because it, I love that it's above ground. You're not getting into a tunnel or anything. Yeah. And the, the view over the, the Charles, over the Longfellow Bridge, one of my favorite, I love looking at the view of the Esplanade. It's wonderful in all seasons, but it's yep. it's the moment where it's not just me, it's everybody turns to look out the window. And right. you have this, like, you know, all these grumbly commuters, it's really tight and blah, blah, blah. But everyone just for just the like this... brief 10 seconds, like, looks out the window, yeah. will maybe take a photo. And it's just this kind of, like, lovely moment where everyone's acknowledging how beautiful something is right that's a really wow what a good answer i i even i used to work in that area and i would love it's my favorite stop for sure um totally. but i appreciate the sort of bustling a nature of, of park street totally you that's can take out the park street so i i feel like charles mdh that's my that's, that's the my answer. Final answer gotcha gotcha um something you're looking forward to in the next month in or around boston hmm I've been trying to get a reservation at Tonino in JP, which is a very hot Italian restaurant. And so I've been having my, I've been getting like resi notification emails for the last <laughs> weeks. But all the reservation openings are for like 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think. Um, this is probably similar to the T answer where I'll probably rattle off some things and then the real answer will be like the third thing in. Sure. Um, you know, one thing that oh actually one thing that i'm doing tonight um we're hosting with american repertory theater at um aeronaut and alston a speed friending event um Ooh. for me side so art is um romeo and juliet is now yeah. up there and so it's kind of like a shakespeare themed speed friending event so 
I'm always really excited to bring, bring B-side in real life. Um, so that's been, that's something I'm looking forward to tonight. See how that goes. Um, this is a little bit further outside of Boston, but I'm going to the big E for the first time. Yeah. Oh my God. You're gonna have so much fun. I know. Yeah. For a shoot next week. So super excited for that. I've, I've heard so much Big E lore. I feel like I've written about it so much. I feel like I know what it is, but mm -hmm. I, I need to see it for myself. So, um, and I feel like that's just a very quintessential New England experience. Yeah. That I've so. I probably won't make it this year, but I went like two or three years ago and I was like shocked how much, because it's exactly what you want, right? It's like, it is a fair, it's got great fried food. It's got great rides, like genuinely totally. like good rides. And you're in and out and that's your day you know you can do all of it and be satisfied totally and sometimes like i think fairs like that too like unless they're really big like the big e they yeah. just kind of seem like eh, you know where this feels like it's an event yeah you have to go out there it's in a little bit a bit of drive and Lots, you know yeah for sure uh and then my last one of these questions is best I, and this is for me personally this has nothing to do with the podcast what's the best breakfast sandwich you've had in boston as someone who tries a lot of food around here yeah um i too actually so vinyl bakery in um somerville okay. or east somerville they um specialize in english muffins Ooh. and so they make their own english muffins and these aren't like the little like a little disc <laughs> yeah or whatever um they're like big boys they're different yeah. you can have them in different flavors they have um house-made sausage and turkey sausage it's like a okay. fresh egg it, it, like duncan could never kind of thing. <laughs> of course not I have a close. and so that's that's really nice and that's also like very easy kind of grab and go um the one that's like not safe for work in terms of just mess is uh oh. <laughs> mike, and, in mike and patty's oh sure uh, uh i think i had it for I had it for the first time a couple years ago but when I went, they were out of bacon, and I remember, or they were out of avocado, I think, because I was going to get a breakfast sandwich that had, like, bacon, egg, cheese, avocado, special sauce. Sure. Um, and they were like, oh, do you want to do something else? I'm like, can I put a hash brown on it? And they were, they said, sure. So they're, um, I think it's like the, I forget the official name of it, but it's like bacon, egg, cheese, special sauce, and then I put a hash brown on it, and that was mm -hmm. delightful. It's a little sloppy gloppy, you know, I think to me an elite breakfast sandwich has some kind of like spread or aioli on it yeah yeah so and both of those sandwiches have different versions of that i believe okay yeah there's a mike and patty's in high street place which is very close to where i work so i haven't given them much of a try but i'm interested and then yes. vinyl i'm definitely adding to the uh to the repertoire yeah for sure what's uh, yours the thing is, like, again, I mentioned earlier, like, I go to New York a lot, and I'm spoiled. I'm, it's just they got better bagels. Um, Quincy has a great place called La Cucina, uh, Cuccia Mina, or Mina. Yeah. Mina? That place is wonderful. They are really kind there. They have good coffee, and they have, they'll make a decent um, sausage, egg, and cheese. It's not a high bar to clear for me. It's just, like, does it taste good, and is it re reasonably cost uh, affordable? Yeah, and I think my one complaint about, like, Boston area – bagels and that whole scene because listen i i think there are a lot of really good bagels around here and i yeah. think um but my issue is that the line at the time that you want to go is often really long and so i think in my head it's it's more of like i wish there were just more so we could kind Agreed. of diffuse the demand yeah like brick street bagels i think they're called the one that has like a, you know a pre-order line for bagels i'm like i'm just not gonna do it because then i'm like, gonna I'm get there in this whole line bagels like to me like i i can't just like predict i'm gonna want a bagel i wake <laughs> up and i know that day like it's a bagel day yes you know? yes um and i think there's a there's a bagel place in harvard square called black sheep bagels yeah, that's yeah. actually pretty good um but heard seen <laughs> amazing well that's what i have emily sherio thank you for joining me on talking marketing today Thanks so um, much for having me. This is great. Yeah, I had a wonderful time. I hope you did as well. We hope people learned a lot. Um, and the one last thing segment of the B-Side newsletter for you, I'm going to ask, uh, where can people find you? What would you like to plug for us today? Well, I'm obviously going to plug B-Side newsletter. You can subscribe to us at bostonbside.com. The little subscribe button should pop up. Um, join the party. There's plenty of us. We'd love to have you. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, also at Boston B-Side. Um, 
And also, please follow our new publication, B-Side Sports. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, if we like to think of B-Side as, you know, learning about your community through the eyes of your informed friend, think of Boston sport, learning about Boston sports teams through the eyes of your informed friend who's a sports nerd. Um, so it's still going to have the same kind of lightness and brevity and humor, um, but a little spin on sports. So we'd love to have you there. And thank you all very much for listening to Talking Marketing. Thanks again to Emily for being here. And uh, plugs on will be after the break here. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.